This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Naturally, when I have an appointment with my favorite doctor. Oh, well, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy. I was going over my notes on the case before you arrived. I came across this old theater program. I think it'll interest you. Garrick's Theater, Sir Basil Wentworth in a revival of Martin Reeves' famous play, The Road is Narrow. A production that you and the great Sherlock Holmes attended, I'm sure. We certainly did, Mr. Bell, though at the time we had no idea that we were about to become involved in the tragic death of Martin Reeves. You've probably heard of him, haven't you, Mr. Bell? It seems to me I had to read him in school, Dr. Oh, Watson. He's rather out of fashion now, like so many other good things. But in the 1890s, apart from Lord Tennyson, there wasn't a more famous writer in England. Or a, a more respected one. The story I'm going to tell you tonight, Mr. Bell, concerns the horrible circumstances surrounding his death. Sounds like a mighty intriguing Sherlock Holmes adventure. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... you have your little talk? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, successful appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives. Kremel never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kremel is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kremel is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair, and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off in your hand. Yet Kremel keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, always looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular death of Martin Reed? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began late on a foggy evening many, many years ago. Sherlock Holmes and I had been to the Garrick Theater to see the revival of Martin Reed's play. And I remember that we decided to walk home to Baker Street. As we approached the old familiar door of 221B, our footsteps echoed hollowly in the deserted street, and the chimes of a neighboring church reminded us of the fact that it was midnight. A delightful evening, Watson. A good dinner, an excellent bottle of wine, and three hours of theatrical magic. Well, personally, I found the play rather depressing. Its theme is a morbid one, but the writing and construction are flawless. Yes, a magnificent play and well worth reviving. By the way, I noticed an item in the Times this morning concerning Martin Reed. He is dangerously ill. Oh, really? Well, he must be quite an old man. Eighty-two, to be precise. Really, he is old as that. Curious career, Watson. His greatest success was written when he was a young man. In the past 50 years, he has never written anything to compare with tonight's play. No, I don't think he... Holmes, look up at our window. Hello. The gas is brightly lighted, whereas Mrs. Hudson invariably turns it low when we're out. And look at the silhouette on the blind. There's a man pacing up and down the room. A visitor. Midnight, Holmes. This looks ominous. Be careful now. It may be some sort of trap. I think not, Watson. If some desperado were lying in wait for me, I doubt whether he'd be stupid enough to turn up the gas to advertise his presence. Well, just same, I wonder how he got in. Presumably through the front door. Mrs. Hudson has instructions to let a client wait in our rooms if his business seems urgent. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Manners. Harvey Manners. How do you do, Dr. Manners? This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you how do, Doctor? Uh, I must apologize for being here at such an hour of night, Mr. Holmes, but my business is urgent. I'm sure it is, Doctor. I left Carlisle this morning, arriving at St. Pancras Station two hours ago. I came directly here, 
persuaded your housekeeper to let me wait for you. Then sit down, my dear doctor, and tell me what urgent business has brought you to London. Uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Holmes, I've been acting in the capacity of personal physician for Martin Reeve, the playwright. Martin Reeve? What an extraordinary coincidence. We've just returned from seeing the revival of his play, The Road is Narrow. We were talking about him as we walked home. I understand the grand old man is dying. He's not in good shape, Mr. Holmes. His heart's in very bad condition. Auricular fibrillation, Dr. Watson. Oh, then at his age, I imagine you don't hold out much hope. No, but I think with care, he might last a year or two. Uh, but uh, the reason I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, is that I'm convinced that although he's a dying man, someone is trying to murder him. To murder him? Good Lord. What reason do you have for saying that, Dr. Manners? Well, Mr. Holmes, I've been in almost daily attendance on Mr. Reeve. Last night... His coachman drove over to get me, saying that his master had suffered another bad attack. When I got to the house, I found that Mr. Reeve had received an, a severe shock. He was in a state of almost complete hysteria, and he kept insisting that he'd seen an apparition in his room a few hours earlier. What kind of an apparition? A ghost from his past, as he referred to it. I think that someone arranged for that apparition, that they knew of his heart condition and also knew that a sudden fright could kill him. It's possible, Dr. Manners, and it would be one of the least detectable methods of murder. But who would want to kill a dying man? Who lives at the house with him, Dr. Manners? His daughter, Catherine, his brother, Silas, who's a drunken good-for-nothing, and his secretary, a fellow by the name of uh, Hugh Kingslake. Uh, do you know the condition of Mr. Reeves as well? Uh, no, but I do know... He had dictated a new one a few days ago. Oh, a fact you. that might easily have provoked a crisis. Uh, Dr. Manners, you will say that Mr. Reeve spoke of seeing an apparition, a ghost from his past. Was he able to describe its appearance? Well, he, he was a little incoherent, but uh, he kept babbling something about blonde hair and blue eyes and a young man who'd come back from beyond the grave to haunt well, him. Don't you think, uh, Dr. Manners, that these might simply be the delusions of an old and, uh, and a sick man? I didn't overlook that possibility, I assure you, Dr. Watson, even though Mr. Reeve's mental faculties are remarkably acute for his age. But last night, after I'd given him a sedative, I examined his room. I found these, Mr. Holmes. That's when I decided to come to you. Oh, well, let's have a look at them. Hmm. They look like... Uh... Blonde hair. Yes, they are, Doctor. I found them on the bedclothes, and yet uh, no one in that house has blonde hair. Interesting. Very interesting. The hair is human, and yet the roots have minute particles of blue attached to them. Obviously, they're from a wig. Get out the timetable, Watson, will you? Yeah. We're going to Carlisle? On the earliest possible train. Though the grand old man of the English theatre is dying, we must do everything in our power to see that his death is not an unnatural one. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm Hugh Kingslake, Mr. Reeves' secretary. Oh, how, do how do you do, do, do sir? Your accommodations at the hotel are satisfactory, I trust, gentlemen? Entirely, yes, thank you, Mr. Kingslake. Thank Good. you. Frankly, I'm most relieved that you're here. Mr. Reeve received a severe shock the night before last. I quite agree with Dr. Manners that someone deliberately induced that shock, knowing the serious condition of Mr. Reeve's heart. Have you any idea who that someone might be? Well, it's a little difficult for me to talk, Mr. Holmes. After all, I'm only an employee here, but, but I can't help feeling... Oh, oh, good morning, Mr. Reeve. Kingsley, who are these men? Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson and Mr. Silas Reeve. How do you do, Mr. Reeve? Oh, yeah. And what may I ask is the professional meddler Sherlock Holmes doing in my brother's house? Oh. I'm here at the request of Dr. Manners. Manners has no right to bring you here, sir. A lot of rubbish. All this talk about apparitions. Nonsense. Martin's in his second childhood. He's become a gibbering old fool. Personally, I wish he'd die and have done with well, it. Well, upon my soul... Never father. mind your soul, my good doctor. Why don't you mind your own business and get out of the house? We don't want detectives here. Mr. Reeve, I've traveled some 200 miles to see your brother. And I have no intention of leaving this house without talking to him. And talk and the devil with you. And if my dear, distinguished brother tells you that I've been sponging on him for years, it's perfectly true. Uncle Scott! <laughs> 
Enter the beautiful Catherine to try and persuade her drunken old uncle to return to his room. No, Uncle Silas. I came to get Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Dr. Manor said that Daddy can see them now. Uh, shall I take them up, Miss Reeve? Uh, no, Mr. Kingslake. I will. And don't be deceived by the Mr. Kingslake and the Miss Reeves, gentlemen. My dear niece and this young man here have a dark secret. A secret that is perfectly apparent to every member of this household. Uncle Silas. <laughs> They're in love. Delightful, isn't it? Uncle, you're intolerable. Will you lead the way, Miss Reeve? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Don't forget to ask him about the play that made him so famous. You might learn some interesting facts. I must apologize for Uncle Silas, gentlemen. I'm afraid he's like this all the time these days. I quite understand, Miss Reeves. It must be very distressing for you, my dear. Well, I'm used to it, Doctor. Here's Daddy's room. I won't come in with you. Too many people upset him. Come in. Please go in, gentlemen. I'll see you later. Ah, there you are. Uh, who is it, Manners? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Mr. Reeve. Ah, good. Good. You can leave us, Manners. Yes, Mr. Reeve. I, uh, I'll see you both later. Very well, Doctor. Uh, come. Sit on my bed. That's it. Uh, how are you feeling, sir? Old. Old and ill. But I'm glad you're both here. Man has displayed unusual enterprise in persuading you to visit me. There's been a lot of nonsense printed about my impending death. Anyone would think a great man is dying. The author of The Road is Narrow is a great man, Mr. Reeve. He was a great man, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean, sir? The author of that play died 45 years ago. What? And yet, his ghost appeared in this room two nights ago. Mr. Reeve, are you saying that you didn't write The Road is Narrow? Yes, my boy, I am. And it's a secret that's been gnawing at me for years. Now that I'm on my deathbed, I'd like to clear my conscience. Then who did write the play, sir? A young friend of mine, by the name of Colin McGrath. I started life as a lawyer's clerk in Keswick, a few miles from here. Colin lived in the same village, and we became great friends. One day, he gave me the manuscript of his play to look at. And I realized it was the work of a genius. Suddenly he died. No one knew about the manuscript. You claimed it uh, as your own, sir? Yes. To my eternal shame, I did. Now, I want to make amends. Mr. Holmes, I want you to find out if any heirs of Colin McGrath still survive. If they do, I'll give them half of my estate. Hmm. Mr. Reeve, does anyone else know of this, uh, fraud? Yes. Knowing that I hadn't long for this world, I confided the secret to three members of my household. And you're convinced that the apparition you saw the other night was that of the dead Colin McGrath? Uh, there was no mistaking him. The blue eyes, the long golden hair. It was Colin or his ghost come to hunt me on my deathbed. This decision on your part to leave half of your estate to any heirs of the man you wronged, was that decision made uh, before you had this strange visitation the other night? Yes. Yes, it was. Did you mention it to any member of your family, sir? No. I did say something to Dr. Manners, and I didn't mention Colin McGrath's name. It's obvious that someone wished to frighten you. Knew your secret and disguised himself to resemble Colin McGrath. Yeah, it was Colin. Never forget his blue eyes. He was standing over there in the chest of drawers. He, he looked at me so, so approachfully. So, uh, Holmes, is he asleep? Yes, Watson. And while he lies there, some member of this household continues to plot his death. We must work fast. Well, what are we going to do? Split forces. I shall remain here for a while and see what may be found out. I'll meet you at our hotel later and we'll compare notes. And what shall I do? Go to the village of Keswick. 
Colin McGrath lived and died there. See what you can find out about him, Watson. Of course I remember Colin McGrath. Well, I should be very grateful for any information about him, madam. As postmistress, I imagine that very little village gossip has escaped you. <laughs> of course it hasn't. I remember the McGrath boy well. He was no good. Didn't he marry poor old Mrs. Northrop's granddaughter, Susan, and then go and desert her just to kill himself? And the poor girl was going to have a baby. No good on earth. That's what young McGrath was. And you can tell him I said so if you ever reached the place I'm sure he went to. Oh, I said, well, ha they have a child, you say. Uh, what happened to it, madam? How should I know? I'm only the postmistress. You'd better go and see the vicar, young man. <laughs> It's a tragic story you've told me, Dr. Watson. But you remember Colin McGrath, sir? Oh, very well. And I always suspected something akin to genius in the boy. But he burned with too hard and gem-like a flame. Uh, as Walter Pater has said, he burned himself out, destroyed his life and poor Susan Northrips with it. She died of a broken heart less than a year after his death. And their child? There was no money. No one to look after the boy. He was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. Then that child, if he's still alive, stands to inherit half of Martin Rees' fortune. If only we can find him. Well, it's good to be back here at the hotel, Holmes. I've had an exhausting day. I trust you had better luck than I did. What did you find out? That Colin McGrath had a child, that his wife died shortly after the child's birth, and that the boy was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. In Liverpool? Go on, Watson. Well, the vicar gave me this photograph of, where we are, of uh, Mrs. McGrath. It was, uh, it was taken on their wedding day. Let me see it. But this is amazing, Watson. One of our problems is solved. Well, I'm blessed if I see how. Let me explain it to you. After you left, I had quite a long talk with the secretary, Hugh Kingslake. It transpired that he knew nothing of his parents. He had been raised in an orphanage, and the only memento he has is a picture of his mother. A picture that he carries in his watch. And that picture... Is a duplicate of this one. Great Scott, then the fellow calling himself Hugh Kingsley is really the Colin McGrath heir. Precisely. A fantastic situation indeed. Come on, old chap. Grab your hat and coat. We must drive over to Mr. Reeves and break the good news that the missing heir is a member of his own household. But we are still no nearer finding out who's been trying to frighten old Mr. Reeves. Surely that's obvious now, Watson. Come in. Dr. Manners, what's wrong? Uh, please, please come at once, both of you. It's Mr. Reeve. Hart? Yes, Dr. Watson. This evening, he had another visit from that apparition. I'm only afraid this time the devilish plan may work and that Martin Reeve won't live through the night. In a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes says is obvious. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not get your money's worth? Why not enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long and always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Remember, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, just as soon as possible, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Let Kreml always keep your scalp feeling clean and refreshed, your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this story certainly has me on the edge of my chair. What happened next? You drove over to Mr. Reeves' house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, we did. And as we went rattling down the country lanes, the flickering oil lamps on Dr. Manor's carriage lighting a shadowy path, 
I found it almost impossible to get a word out of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, sometimes you're the most irritating man on earth. And what prompts that little tirade, Watson? You haven't opened your mouth since we left our hotel. Purposeless conversation is a waste of time. Not much further, is it, Dr. Manners? No, Mr. Holmes. We're nearly there. Well, I don't consider conversation purposes when it clarifies the problem, Holmes. You said it was obvious who had been frightening Mr. Reeve. I suppose I'm stupid, but I find it far from obvious. And yet the facts are clearly in front of your eyes. Eyes. That's it, Watson. Think about eyes. The, the blue eyes of the supposed ghost, eh? But the Reeves family have all got brown eyes. Apparently, it's a marked family characteristic. Quite, Watson. That fact should lead you to the obvious conclusion. Oh, you're always talking in riddles, Holmes, with the rules. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. And Hugh Kingslake is standing at the front door. How is he, Mr. Kingslake? Better, Mr. Holmes. Seems to have rallied a bit. But I'm glad you're all here. I'll drive my carriage round to the stables. Be back in a moment. Well, come in, gentlemen. With uh, Mr. Reeves so ill... It may seem a little inappropriate to announce my news. But uh, Catherine consented to marry me tonight. We're engaged. Oh, really? My congratulations. Thank yes, you. indeed. She's a charming girl. Oh, Catherine, darling. I've uh, told them our news. Oh, it must seem a terrible time to announce it, Mr. Holmes, with poor Daddy lying so ill upstairs. It's quite understandable, Miss Reeve. And uh, before we go up and see your father, I'd like you both to know that we have something in the nature of a wedding present for you. A wedding present? Yes, you're both familiar with the story of Colin McGrath, I understand? You mean that he was the true author of The Road is Narrow? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Daddy told us all about it. And did you also know that Mr. Reeve is planning to leave half his estate to the heir of Mr. McGrath? I knew that, Dr. Watson. In uh, my capacity as secretary, I had occasion to draw up a rough draft of the new will a few days ago. Then I'm sure, Mr. Kingslake, that you'll be very interested to know that today Dr. Watson and I discover that you are the son of Colin McGrath. The... That I am? You is the heir? Well, that doesn't seem possible. The fact is proven beyond a doubt, Miss Reeve. Then, then if Mr. Reeve makes the new will, I stand to inherit half the fortune. Yes, my boy, you do. That's what Mr. Holmes meant when he was talking about wedding presents. Hey, come here, somebody! That's Uncle Silas. He's upstairs with Dad. What's wrong, Mr. Reeve? Fire! I knocked over a lamp in Martin's room. And Daddy's up there. The room's oh. ablaze. What? Come on, Watson. Well, the whole top landing is burning, Holmes. Can't go through this way. We can't, just can't stand here. Mr. Reeve will roast alive. I, I'm going after him. Come back, Kingslake. Come back, come back. Great Scott, he went right through the flames, Holmes. Send one of the servants for the fire brigade and tell the rest to bring buckets of water and to bring them fast. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how is Hugh? Well, he's going to pull through, Miss Reeve. He's badly burned, but he'll be all right, won't he, Dr. Manners? Yes, oh. yes, a few weeks in the hospital, and he'll be as good as new. And Father? Well, uh, I am afraid he's dead, Catherine. Dead? Oh, poor Daddy. Oh, my dear, he might have lived for a time, but the shock of the fire coming so close on top of the other one was too much for him. He died just as I took him from your fiancé's arms. So that by knocking over a lamp, I, I was responsible for my brother's death? Yes, Mr. Reeve. The credit is yours. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the local police might consider booking you on a charge of arson. Rubbish! It was an accident and you can't prove otherwise. Possibly not. But there's one matter I can settle here and now. Two nights ago, someone in this house tried to murder Martin Reeve by posing as Colin McGrath. The same despicable action was repeated tonight. Well, one person that we can eliminate is Hugh Kingslake. He nearly gave his life just now, trying to save his employer. Then who was responsible, Mr. Holmes? A feature of the impersonation that especially struck your father, Miss Reeve, was the color of the eyes. He described them as a brilliant blue. Then that rules out Catherine and me, and we both have brown eyes. Precisely, Mr. Reeve. I have devoted some considerable study to the art of disguise. There are wigs and uh, methods of altering height and weight. But the color of the eyes cannot be altered. Watson, ten minutes ago you had the opportunity of examining Mr. Kinslake's eyes without the tinted glasses he's in the habit of wearing. Well, they did fall off when he, when he stumbled back the down, down, the, down the back stairs, but I can't say that I noticed the color of his eyes. They were blue, Watson. Brilliant blue, just as his father's were before him. You mean that young Kingslake was responsible? Yes, Mr. Reeve, I do. But that's ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. He just hurt himself severely in trying to save father. True, Miss Reeve. But surely his reason was obvious. 
He intended to marry you. And when he learned a few days ago that your father planned to will half his estate to the McGrath heir, he decided to try and kill him before that will could be put into effect. Oh, I see it all, Holmes. And then tonight, he realized that he was the heir. Precisely, Watson. And so it was to his great advantage to see that his employer stayed alive to execute that new will. That accounts for his bravery in the fire tonight. I can't believe it, are you, Mr. Holmes? I can. I've always disliked you, and I'll have great pleasure in prosecuting him. Huh? It'd be hard to prove, Silas. After all, your brother did die a natural death. Yes, Dr. Manners. I fear that legally there's very little we can do to Mr. Kinslake. But when he recovers and realizes that he risked his life for nothing, I think he'll find his own punishment. The change in the will was not made. The estate will be divided between the family, and I doubt if Mr. Kinslake will now acquire any of it by marriage. No, of course he won't. I'll never see him again. Oh, quite right, my dear, quite right. What a despicable scheme. And to think that, that his father wrote one of the greatest plays of our century. I prefer to forget the fact, Watson. Emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear thinking. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance is uh, a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. And now, my dear chap, I think we should look up the next train back to London. Our work here is done. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.